Hi friends, today we're doing Unit 2, Lesson 10, Wings and Feathers, Part 1. We're first going to go over the vocabulary that will be in today's reading. Our first word is cavity, which is a hollow space within a body, a bone, or an organism. Our second word is glide, which means to move smoothly and continuously. Our next word is insulation, which is material that separates an area in order to keep in a form of energy. And our last word is nest, a structure formed and used by animals for laying and hatching eggs. We are now going to move into today's reading. Hello folks, it's me, Rattenboro, once again. If you recall, you learned all about reptiles last time. How exciting that was. Can you remember which group of animals you are going to hear about today? Birds, I can't wait to tell you all about my friend, Ebenezer. I met him on the continent of Africa. Before I tell you about him, I thought we would begin today's lesson by quickly reviewing how Paolo, Tabitha, and Anna are related to each other. Remember, just because they don't look the same, they do have quite a bit in common, beginning with the fact that they are all members of the animal kingdom. I brought along special diagrams of their skeletons to help you. Can you tell which skeleton belongs to each animal? What common characteristic is visible in all three? Yes, all three of them have backbones. So as you probably recall, scientists classify them as, yes, vertebrae. We're not going to spend much time talking about their internal body temperatures today, but by now you should know that none of them have constant body temperatures. Paolo, Tabitha, and Anna are all cold-blooded and their temperature changes depending on their surroundings. That makes two characteristics that all three of them hold in common. The fact that they are all vertebrates and the fact that they are all cold-blooded animals. But now, let's see where Ebenezer Egret fits in. We know that he belongs to the animal group classified as birds. Let's confirm it. Are birds vertebrates? Indeed they are. Ebenezer has a strong backbone that reaches all the way up his long neck and supports his head. His bony skeleton is very important. His bones are extremely light with lots of air cavities or hollow places inside them to help him fly. He uses his muscular legs to push off the ground and then his wings take over. The weight and arrangement of his bones help him soar through the air. Their bones are extremely light with lots of air cavities or hollow places inside them to help them fly. Birds are the lucky ones, aren't they? How many of you have ever wished that you could fly? I do like very much being a rat, but sometimes I think it would be great fun to fly. Ebenezer is very graceful, isn't he? So far you have learned in detail just about cold-blooded animals, reptiles, amphibians, and fish. Do you think Ebenezer and all birds are cold-blooded too? Scientists classify birds as warm-blooded because their internal body temperature remains constant no matter where they fly. Birds have several characteristics that enable them to fly, but being warm-blooded is essential to flight. They have a very high metabolism as only warm-blooded animals do. Metabolism is the process that produces energy in most animals' bodies. When we speak about the high metabolism of birds, we are speaking about the fact that they have a steady flow of energy that helps them maintain the high levels of activity required by flight. The higher the activity level of an animal, the higher its metabolism is likely to be. What this means when it comes to eating is that they need lots of food to maintain that energy. Have you ever heard the saying, eats like a bird, for someone who eats very small amounts of food at one time? Ebenezer told me, that an important thing to remember about this expression is that it does not mean that birds do not eat very much. In fact, Ebenezer and birds like him need to eat two times their body weight in food every day because they have such a high metabolism and burn lots more energy than most animals. Of course, there are lots of small meals a day for birds. Quite unlike Anna Anaconda, who sometimes eats only one big meal in a period of many days, so someone who eats like a bird is usually someone who picks at their food and only eats small bits at a time. So like all birds, Ebenezer is warm-blooded and he's a vertebrate with lightweight bones to help him fly. Look at this image and describe some other physical characteristics that help scientists classify Ebenezer as a bird. Good eyes, boys and girls. Let's begin with his wings. Ebenezer has wings and wings are essential to flight. 
The shape of a bird's wings determines how far and high a bird can fly, in addition to its lightweight bones. Look at this picture of an American bald eagle. His, broad, his long, broad wings are built so that he can glide or move smoothly and continuously. He can soar great distances, traveling up to 65 miles per hour. Compare the eagle's wings to the tiny tapered wings of the hummingbird, one of the smallest birds on earth. His wings beat rapidly, 20 or more beats per second, as he hovers or floats and flutters in midair. What else helps Ebenezer and all birds fly? Feathers are a great help serving as lightweight coverings for their wings. They mesh together as their wings flap downward, parting again to let air through as their wings sweep upward. Feathers also act as insulation. Insulation is an extra layer that protects birds' skin from the sun and traps in heat, providing energy and warmth in the winter months. The point of the feather, where it is attached to a bird's body, is called the quill. All birds have feathers, no other animals do. So if you spot a feathered friend, you may assume that it's a bird. Because their precious feathers take quite a beating, birds take good care of them and often preen them with their beaks to keep them clean, waterproof and in the right position. Take a look at Ebenezer's beak. Isn't it a beauty? Not all birds have such long beaks. Why do you think this is so long? Well, I'll tell you. He told me it's a terrific hunting weapon. He uses the end of his beak to grab small prey, such as snails and crayfish, in the surface waters of the marshland, and to spear larger prey, such as frogs and snakes, on marshy wetlands. Appearing in many different shapes and sizes, beaks are often used to identify birds. Their main function is for feeding, so a bird's beak can provide scientists with clues to a bird's eating habits. Take a look at this finch's beak. Depending upon where you live, you may have seen a finch at your bird feeder. They use their beaks to crack open seeds. Next time you see a bird, look at its beak and see if you can guess whether it eats fish, seeds, insects, mice, or nectar. Birds' feet are another clue to different bird habitats and lifestyles. Hawks have long talons or claws to catch their prey. Waders have long legs. Woodpeckers have feet adapted to climbing trees. Perching birds have single hind or rear toes for grasping branches, and ducks and geese have webbed feet for swimming. Birds are the only group of animals that give birth by only one means. They are fascinating pattern breakers in all of the other groups. All birds lay their eggs. Their eggs are yolk filled and have hard calcified shells. They need to be incubated or kept warm so the parents sit on them until they hatch. This can be dangerous because sitting birds are prime targets for predators. Most birds prepare a nest or shelter for their young, using whatever materials are available to them in nature. Some make nests from twigs and straw. Others build nests of mud. Woodpeckers create cavities in trees, whereas kingfishers bore into riverbanks. These nests provide safe havens or safe places, protecting both eggs and baby chicks from harsh weather and animal predators. Some birds, like chickens, are able to see, walk, and feed themselves almost immediately after hatching. However, many birds are born in a very immature stage and require a lengthy period of parental care. We spent lots of time today talking about what, what helps birds fly. Strong muscles, light bones, powerful wings, and airy feathers. But did you know that in spite of having all those things in common, some birds are unable to fly? Flightless birds include the largest bird on earth, the ostrich. With a seven foot wingspan, it seems odd that ostriches can't fly, but they hold records for being both the fastest birds on land and the fastest two-legged animals on earth, able to run up to 40 miles per hour. Australian emus, also large and flightless, look a lot like ostriches and often travel long distances to find food. Penguins are perhaps the most endearing or affection-inspiring of all flightless birds. These aquatic birds of the southern hemisphere waddle along their short legs and webbed feet down to the sea. Their wings serve as flippers, carry them swiftly through Arctic waters, traveling up to 15 miles per hour. Birds live all over the world, in cool, wet rainforests along ocean shores, in dark, dense, evergreens and hot dry deserts and on the banks of lakes, rivers and streams. 
Some travel long distances, migrating to warmer homes in winter, whereas others are homebodies, never straying very far from where they were born. Some can swim and others can fly. Some enchant us with their songs, whereas others shout, caw, caw. Birds come in all different shapes and sizes, but all birds are warm-blooded, egg-laying vertebrates with feathers and wings. Birds are very different from the animals we will study next time. So far you've learned about fish, amphibians, reptiles, and birds. What do you suppose is next? I'll give you a hint. They're hairy and warm-blooded, and you just may find that you know more about them than you think you know. Thank you for being such good listeners. I will see you very soon. You may now move on to Unit 2, Lesson 10, Google Forms.